go live. Okay, I think we are live. Let me put this. Come on. Awesome. Welcome back, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's Low Physics webinar. My name is Alejandro, and I'm going to be your host. Today, we are presenting Spectral Difference Methods for Astrophysical Fluid Dynamics by David Velasco Romero. Um, David earned his Bachelor in Physics from Universidad de Guadalajara, then did his Master's at Instituto de Ciencias Físicas at UNAM, and then his PhD in Computational Modeling and Scientific Computing from Universidad Autónoma del Estado de Morelos. He then moved for his first postdoc at the Institute for Computational Science at the University of Zurich. David is currently a postdoctoral research associate at the Department of Astrophysical Sciences at Princeton University. His research interests include high-performance computing, parallel and GPU computing, computational fluid dynamics, and planet formation, with emphasis in planet-disk interactions. We are delighted to have him in low physics today. Remember, you can ask questions over email through YouTube channel or Twitter, and then the questions will be read at the end of David's talk. David's talk. So without further ado, we will turn time over to David. Thanks for joining us, and thank you, David, for being today with us. Uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, should I start showing now my, yes. my slides? Think, yes, you can. Let's try it. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. So I'll be presenting this work uh, on spectral differences that I've been developing for the past almost three years with, with these people, Maria Vega, Contan Wagner, and Romain Tessier. And well, in you're aware that in computational polydynamics for astrophysics, it covers a large range of scales from galaxy clusters, galaxies, stars, circumstellar disk, planets. Here are some examples, the galaxy, uh, the sun, and one of the circumstellar or protoplanetary disk with here uh, a planet. This is a simulation against an observation. And we use these magnetohydrodynamics uh, equations to simulate, to these systems to replace the what experiments do in physics. We do simulations to then uh, have something to compare against theory. So in this case, I'm going to talk about one of the methods to do this kind of discretization of these equations, which is uh, cell-based methods. There are also particle-based methods. And I'm going to start with the equations, just the Euler equations or Navier-Stokes, so which are conservation laws for for mass, momentum, and energy, which actually can be written in this compact form. Just uh, the evolution, the update of a quantity is given by the divergence of the flux, where these now we have a for the Euler equations, we have a U vector, which comprises the conservative variables, density, uh, momentum, and energy, and the respective fluxes of each of, of those quantities. Now, in these mesh-based methods, what we do is we approximate the solution of this partial differential equation with, uh, with segments. So we discretize our, our space. For instance, here I'm showing you what would be the, the representation of this nonlinear solution in a piecewise constant or first order approximation. And then we, I'm gonna talk about the one of the most common, commonly used methods, the Godunov method for this Euler system of equations, which is a finite volume scheme for this conservation of loss now in integral form. So here again, I have a nonlinear solution and I approximate this nonlinear solution by piecewise constant uh, values. And we assign to these, each one of these segments the control volume average as shown here 
of this segment, which also is a value at the at the midpoint of this cell. And then what we need is to know or compute the fluxes between these different cells to know what would be the update of the evolution of our solution. Now, these fluxes are computed with what it's called, a, uh, it's a real problem. So it's, we use human solvers to, to compute the, what would be the flux between these two things. And this flux is unique between these two cells in order to then enforce conservation of, of, any, of every of those quantities that I mentioned before. Now, how do you compute these fluxes? So the naive approach would be to make a, an average between these two values at the interface between the cells. And if we were to do that, we would find out that that it's actually unstable. And that's unstable because we are neglecting the proper propagation of information. So if we take into account now that the velocity, for instance, in this case is positive, then we would see that at the next time step, the solution should be something like this, so that you see that the, the value at the interface should be the one coming from the left. Whereas if the velocity were to be negative, the value actually at the interface should be the one coming from the right. We can write these in this uh, compact notation, which is called upwinding. So if you see, this turns to be what I mentioned before. If the velocity is positive, these terms cancel and we have, we recover UI. And if the velocity is negative, the other two terms cancel and we recover U plus one, U uh, at I plus one. Now we can rewrite this equation in this form where these are the fluxes. And this, if we write it in this form, we see that it's a, it's simply the, the gradient of the quantity multiplied by this factor. So if we plug in again, these new flux into this equation, we see that the modify equation results to be this one with an extra term, which is a diffusive term with a diffusion coefficient nu, which is given by this factor. So we now see that the numerical diffusion is gonna scale with the velocity of the fluid and also with the size of the mesh. Where here C is what it's called the current factor, and which is a value that it's supposed to be below one, so that the, the time step taken in a simulation should be such that it's controlled by the velocity and the size of the mesh, such that information does not prop, like skip one cell. So the propagation like information or any quantity should just be advected from one cell to the neighboring one. Now, uh, as I mentioned before, this is a first order approximation, but we want to go to higher order to actually reduce this numerical diffusion that I mentioned before. So we can go to something like piecewise linear, now approximation of the solution, which would be second order, or even a piecewise linear parabolic approximation, which would be third order, where you see that we are adding more terms. Now, in practice, we have, as I mentioned before, the finite volume method, as the Gononov scheme here in second order. And here, another kind of method, which is finite element method, which SD is one of those, the method spectral difference that I'm going to present is one of those. And here, what I want to show is the kind of stencil needed to interpolate things at the interfaces to then compute or solve the real problem. And so, here we have disconnected cells in finite volume, in the finite volume approach that we then compute the, we solve the random problem and we, we compute the fluxes between these, these cells. This is a stencil at second order to compute those 
interpolated values at, at these phases, whereas for finite element at second order, it actually it's something compact. So all these subcells within what it's called an element share an a stencil, a polynomial stencil. So they are all computed using all of all the other values. So if we move to third order, the stencil, for instance, for finite volume would still be this one, just to compute the the to interpolate to interface values. And for finite element, it will be something like this. Now we have nine subcells within the element. Then again, all of those are used to interpolate to different positions within the element. And now we can extend this to fourth, fourth order. And now the important thing here is that if we move to, to if we take into account parallelization, so if we are doing massive simulations, which is commonly done in astrophysics, we have this MEN domain and we have what it called these gold cells. So these gold cells allow for the interpolation to happen at the boundaries. Now, if this domain is too large, the common thing is to subdivide this domain in multiple subdomains, assigning this, each one of these subdomains to different CPUs to be computed in parallel. And now each one of these CPUs are gonna have boundaries, these goal cells, that are gonna be boundary conditions given by the neighboring processes. So then you see that there is a need for communication between these processes. And the issue now is that we need to, we need to do uh, methods, well, rely on methods that actually are not bounded by the cost of this memory, that actually there is a balance between the, the computational cost and the memory cost, the, or the cost to communicate this information. Now, if we move to the, the stencil of the reconstruction, now to solve actually the memory problem, we see that for instance, in third order finite volume, in order to compute these values at flux points, in this in this side of the let's here I'm let's think that this is uh, a given CPU and that this is another CPU computing this domain. Then this is information in blue needed to compute these points in blue, and to then solve the mirror problem, we, we would also need these red points on the neighboring uh, process or processor. And you see that in this case, we need two layers of information to actually solve either we communicate these layers and allow this process to compute both uh, pairs of, of points, or we just communicate this number of layers, allowing it to, com to compute these, these points. And then we send these flux points and so we can solve the remaining problem. Uh, in the finite element method, you only need to, com to communicate flux points as these flux points are computed with the information of the element. So they don't need information from the adjacent element. The only thing that we, we need to do is communicate the flux points. So in this case, you can see that the cost, this is this cost twice the information to be sent than in this case. And if we move to fourth order, the same thing applies. And now you can see that the cost is actually three times larger in terms of memory to be sent information in this case than in this case. So in short, uh, finished volume methods are light in computations. They're quite, quite simple, but they're quite heavy in, com in communications as you go to high order. Vice versa, a fourth order uh, finite element methods are really heavy in computations. They are expensive to compute this interpolation using all of these, these stencil, but they're really light in communications. And this turns out to be really good match for high, high parallel hardware that we have av um, available now, like 
for instance, GPUs, graphic processing units. And that's why there's more and more people playing with finite element methods to uh, to make use of this power given by, by these highly parallel processing units. Now, I'm gonna talk a little bit about this spectral difference method that I that I mentioned before. So as I said before, we divide the domain in Cartesian cells, or in this case, elements. And inside each one of these elements, we define a set of P plus one, P plus one solution points. And the solution inside the element is given by Lagrange polynomials of degree P. So we represent the solution inside the element using these bases of Lagrange polynomials. Now, we also have another set of points of P plus two flux points. Again, now using a different set of Lagrange polynomials of the degree P plus one. So here I'm showing you in this red, the flux points in X, in the salmon color, the flux points in the Y direction. And where we compute the divergence of the flux, now using another the Lagrange, uh, the derivative of the Lagrange polynomials at flux points. So how it looks, the interpolation in this case, it's something like this. Like we have solution points, we make this operation on, on, on these solution points using the Lagrange polynomials evaluated at, at flux points. And we obtain these flux points with where these flux points internal to the element don't need of a Riemann problem. The only ones that need to of a Riemann problem a Riemann solver are the ones at the edge, which are gonna be shared by another element. After computing these, we then use this operation to go and compute what would be the update at the solution points. Now, of course, this being 2D, there is a part in X and its counterpart in, in Y. So there are two contributions to the update of a given quantity. And this is how these Lagrange basis for polynomials look like. So in order to ensure instability, uh, stability, sorry, there is the need to, to actually collocate the flux points at the gauss lagrange corridor points, plus these two end points. And this is something that actually it's, uh, it's one of the pitfalls of this kind of method that for, for stability reasons, it forces the flux points to be at those positions to be squeezed closer and closer to the boundary. And that keeps a non-uniform mesh within the element. Now, as for the solution points, we can place them wherever we want within these, now what we call control volumes or subcells inside the, the element. And for our method, we use a time integration that it's an other method, which is a predictor uh, step, semi-implicit method, or well, an implicit method that it's, uh, that it's updated using a, a, a predictor corrector. And in this case, as I, the stability condition that I mentioned before, the grand condition, is now pondered by the order of the solution. And something that I forgot to mention is that this other method, we're using it to actually match in the integration in time, the order of the integration in time with the order of the spatial discretization. So now these are how the, how the control volumes look for different orders in this method. And as I mentioned before, you can see that this requirement of st stability of the flux points makes this non-uniform mesh within the elements. Now here I'm gonna show you uh, the performance of finite volume second order uh, and this SD other fourth order 
comparing in both cases uh, 20 degrees of freedom per site. So here would be 20 cells, and here would be five elements of four subcells inside each element. And if we let this evolve, we see that infinite volume, we already see the, the diffusion dominating the solution. Whereas for fourth order, we can actually preserve after one loop of the of this advection of a sine wave, we can preserve the initial profile. And if we actually make a, a study of the convergence of how well it it preserves this this initial condition after advection, we see that these kind of methods, like high order methods have what it's called exponential convergence. So we see that the convergence, so the error, the difference between the initial solution and the solution after being advected scales with the order of the approximation. So we see here that, for instance, at eight order, well, at seven order, sorry, it's already getting to machine precision so that the error it can it cannot go lower than this because this is already the error given by the machine precision so you cannot make a difference smaller than that whereas for something like second order even with more uh with more elements or more cells you are really far like by a large amount of of orders of magnitude from what it's what you can achieve with uh eight order now that was the behavior of these kind of methods with smooth solutions but if we move to now to these continuous solutions and make the same experiment as before we encounter now these oscillations which is simply the gibbs phenomenon so we can avoid this by going to infinite order if you go so first order it will behave as soon as you go to higher than first order you're going to encounter these kind of oscillations which are not part of the solution it's an artifact of your finite discretization and it's something that in physics actually it's could be quite dangerous because these oscillations for instance if you are thinking about density or pressure it can signify that your 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 density or pressure could be negative, which is something not physical. So we want to avoid this thing both for the numerical part and for the physics part. And what we want to do, for instance, what we decided to do in this case is to mix these two kind of methods. So you, you can see here that this uh, finite volume second order cosmic method, although it is diffusive, it is well behaved. There are no oscillations. So we want to to use this method to control these oscillations, wherever we encounter an oscillation, we are going to replace the solution, this oscillatory solution, with something well behaved or bounded. And in SD, we can do that because there is actually an equivalence between the, the two methods. So in, in terms of the, how a control volume it's updated these subcells or control volumes, inner control volumes to the to the element. The update actually can be written instead of what I showed you before. It can be done in a in a finite volume way, and therefore we can actually replace the fluxes, the high order fluxes, with low or second order fluxes whenever we encounter problems. And so now we need a criteria to actually distinguish what are, which one are the, the values that are incorrect. So we have uh, two criteria, which is one is the numerical one and the other one is a physical one. And in the numerical one, you can see here that we require that the, the solution at n plus one, which is the next time step, is with, within the values of the solution at the previous time step. If we have a, a new extremum, then we 
we have a detection of the smoothness of this extrema. So if this new extrema is extremum is smooth, we allow it to, to evolve. We say that it's not a something incorrect. But if it's not something smooth, we need to correct this thing. And as I mentioned before, we require also the density and pressure to be positive. And instead of correcting the whole solution within a, a cell or an element, we actually are going to make use of these equivalence to clinic volume at the subcell level and only replace the fluxes of subcells within the element. So we do that, we compute a candidate solution with now these being the high order fluxes. And if this candidate solution is considered troubled by the criteria I mentioned before, we then replace the fluxes with a second order Gondunov method. So for instance, in 1D, we would have that a trouble cell will have replaced, its fluxes replaced with second order fluxes. And the neighboring cells would also have one of the fluxes. So one, one high order flux and another second order flux. So let's see how now the, the solution behaves for high order. Now adding this correction of trouble cells. We're here in this video in red. I was showing the cells that were detected or subcells that were detected as problematic and they then were corrected. And now we see that the solution is bounded by the initial condition. There are no longer oscillations. And if we evolve this thing to not just one orbit, but five laps on this box, we see that for instance, second order, it's, it's getting quite diffusive. Whereas for for order, we preserve the this shape that it's not is not uh, symmetric, but it's now well behaved in terms of not being oscillatory. So we see that for different orders, we gain now that these oscillations that were happening before at discontinuities are now controlled. And we also see that if we go back to smooth solutions, this trouble detection is actually not hindering the performance that we were observing before. Now we can move to hydro test. So this is the shock tube test where we are going to have, we have a discontinuity between two fluids. We, the simulation is just like you remove uh, the boundary between this, these two fluids, this and then we're going to see a rarefaction, a contact discontinuity, and a shock wave evolving. Again, in red, I'm showing you which ones are the cells that are that are corrected in a slice of this this 2D simulation. And if we make a study of the performance of the of the code with second, fourth, and eighth order, we see that there is a slight advantage here of going to to high order. Well, in this case, it's, it's a clear advantage. And also the nice thing here is that we see that here in gray, I'm drawing the, the elements. So we see that these, these continuities are actually captured within elements. And if we now check what is the behavior of the, of the method with a constant number of the degrees of freedom, so second, again, second, fourth, eighth order, but now, uh, with half the number of, so that the number of cells, the, the product between number of cells and the order plus one is constant. So in this case, 160, we see that there is a slight benefit of going to high order. And now if we move to a 2D hydro test, this is uh, known as a Kevin Helmholtz instability. So we have two fluids, one, with different densities, one moving to the right, one moving to the left. And there are gonna be some eddies that are gonna be formed due to 
the shear between these uh, these fluids and the size of these eddies depends both on the size of the control volumes and on the numerical diffusion. So if your code is too diffusive, these thing these vortices are not going to form. Now, again here, I want to show that as similar to, to what I mentioned before for the 1D test, that these instabilities can actually be described within the subcells of an element. And as I also mentioned before, one of the, the drawbacks of these kind of methods is that it imprints these non-uniform geometry of the, of the element. Now the previous one was a, a, start, uh, a test with a with a shock, but not a strong one. So now, if we move to to what's called the double mag reflection, which is again a fluid now being affected against a reflective wall, and we're here. I'm showing you the solution for for different uh, resolutions at second order. Here, just. Uh, the density, whereas here I'm showing you some contours of the density uh, and imposing over these contours of the density, the cells or subcells that were corrected. And you see that these detections are aligned with the discontinuities. And actually, if we go to high order, we see that because of that, that only in discontinuities, we see these kind of detections. Actually, even in these cases, where you require, when you have these continuities that you require of this triggering of the fallback scheme, this second order fallback scheme, you still gain, you still gain from going to high order. So again, the same experiment as before, second, fourth, eighth order with a constant number of decreases freedom, just doubling resolution row by row. And we do see that there is a, ben a benefit of going to high order, where for instance here, eight order, with uh, 100 cells, it's arguably better than what you get with second order and, and 1,100, 1,600, sorry, cells. Now, uh, the work that I mentioned before is, it has been already been published, is the first paper of, of this code. And what we want to do now is to actually use this for, for some astrophysical things. And what we have in mind is to actually tackle low mag number flows and stellar interior problems, which are in stellar interiors, we have, we have these highly subsonic flows that, as mentioned here, are characterized by these small perturbations around an equilibrium solution that develop in, into this thermal turbulent convection. The usual approach to this kind of problem is to either do Navier Stokes or include uh, magnetism, so MHT, in some sort of approximation. So, and typically, these approximations what do is neglect the propagation of, of sound waves, where this flows by being really subsonic which means that the sound speed is way larger than the velocity of the fluid, are constrained, the, the time step is constrained by the sound speed. So more and more time steps accumulate with, a, with the sound speed, and there you are dominated by numerical diffusion. So in order to see like the, the performance of the method in these kind of scenarios, we started with, with a LOMAC number study without just a smooth profile, which is called the Gresham vortex. So this is a rotating smooth profile. And I'm showing, I'm showing you again the same experiment, second, fourth, eight order with the same number of degrees of freedom. For here, a Mach number of, of um, 20 minus two. And you see that all of them perform well. You can see a little bit, this one being a little bit more diffusive. But if, as you decrease the Mach number, so if you go to 10 to the minus three, you start seeing that now this solution is dominated by numerical diffusion. And if you go even to a lower Mach number to 10 to the minus four, you see that this solution is completely 
washed off, whereas fourth and eighth order can actually still preserve the solution. And in this case, you can actually fix this by, by just doubling the resolution, which would be equivalent to making something like this in terms of in terms of the of the cost of the of the computation. But in this case, you can see that, that it will take a lot of more resolution to actually do something like this. But so that is the performance of the, of the of the method with smooth profiles. Now what happens if we have low Mac numbers, low Mac number flows with discontinuities? So this is the valid Taylor instability where I'm showing you here the solution for second order method with increasing resolution. So, so that you see that increasing the resolution, you, you have these uh, kevin Helmut's instabilities, secondary instabilities developing around these initial relative instability. So we did the same study with, uh, with high order, and you do see that this trend of getting more instabilities increases even at the same number of degrees of freedom by increasing the order. So we see that now, low Mac number, even with uh, with discontinuities, you do get a benefit of going to high order at the same number of degrees of freedom. Where again, it's arguably similar solution with, in this case, with half the number of degrees of freedom than in this case for second order. Now, another part of this scenario of stellar interiors is doing the evolution of a small perturbation over a hydrostatic equilibrium, where here the challenge is that your perturbation is so small over this, this equilibrium solution that you have to evolve, that if your solution goes to something close, approaches machine precision, then you're gonna, your method can possibly washed off all that that solution and we can see that here for instance where i have a, a small pulse over a hydrostatic equilibrium again the same exercise second fourth order fourth and eighth order for a pulse of 10 to the minus four and you see that even at 10 to the minus four second order is already uh smearing the solution we go to 10 to the minus eight we see that now fourth order is is not able to handle to keep this small perturbation. And if we go to even 10 to the minus 12, which is really close to, to machine precision, eight order is able to still able to do it. It's, you, you start seeing some small oscillations that it's having trouble doing it, but it's still able to do it. Whereas these uh, second and fourth order are by no means able to do it. So, all these three things combined are actually needed to make these kind of simulations, the solar convection simulations, which are, it, in this case, I'm showing you a simplified scenario, which is a 2D stratified medium. And with, that starts with a small perturbation on density that grows into these uh, by, by relative instability grows by, by buoyancy, grows into this thermal convection. And the diffusion of your method, it's gonna, it's gonna have an impact on the evolution of, of this thermal convection. So we, in order to make, to be able to compare the performance of the method with different orders in this kind of experiment, we made a further reduction, simplification of this problem where now we're gonna have, instead of like these small random perturbations of density, just a perturbation, a bubble. So a, a soup dense hot bubble in this stratified medium, they're gonna let evolve in this convective region. And you, you see here these evolving into, into turbulent convection. And we did the same experiment with different orders. Again, the same thing as mentioned before, quite repetitive. 
second, fourth, eighth order. And again, you see that also in this scenario, you gain from going to high order in terms of, at least here in quality, you see more instabilities. But what about in a, in a study more quantifying the performance of the method? So we let this thing evolve to longer times. And then we analyze what was the, the, the spectrum of the kinetic energy. And we started seeing that actually going to high order allows to have uh, more energy at smaller scales, which I, I'm not showing here, but it's also the trend that you get at, for instance, second order. If you increase the resolution, you see the same trend. You see that that you have more energy at smaller scales. So this is actually the state of, of the art of, of what we're doing. Uh, in summary, what we have is uh, this. We have coupled this method with, with a finite volume fallback scheme that allows to control oscillations, which is the first paper. We included in this method uh, what is called a well-balanced scheme to actually enhance the performance of the code with these small perturbations over high equilibrium resolutions. We have a uh, working MHD code for 2D. Uh, we have another version of the code, uh, 3D in C++, and that's to allow uh, to do massive simulations dividing the domain. The, and we have the ongoing work is, as I showed you before, this test for Lomac numbers that is suggesting like the benefits of going to high order. We're testing the this MHD feature in 2D. And the next steps of my work would be to include MHD in 3D in the C++ code and include uh, CUDA and MPI. Well, CUDA, it already has MPI, but include CUDA to actually be able to use GPUs and use the full power of, of the clusters available right now. And that's it. Thanks. Thank you, David, for this wonderful talk on several numerical methods. Let me check uh, if there are questions over here or if someone here has a question. Um, so let me start uh, with one of the questions. So when you were comparing the second order with the, uh, okay, I forgot the names, but you have this poles that is a square and, and you said like the implementation of one of those creates an asymmetry. Is there a way to understand what causes that, that asymmetry, given the symmetry of the problem? Yes. So this, the asymmetry comes that, yeah, from, here. From, from here. Yeah. So you see here that that okay that in high order in the the non controlled version you already have an asymmetry. And asymmetry is given by the by the propagation by by the I infection. See. Now, once you try to correct these these asymmetric oscillations, you're going to have something that even even though it's controlled bounded, sorry. It's gonna be. It's gonna have the asymmetry that that you were trying to control, right? Mm -hmm. and, and and knowing that, is there a way? Okay, maybe is is this a problem? Is that something you want to solve? Given that you know where is it coming, maybe is there a way like to to correct for that? Or use not that information I can think of, of the others. I mean, okay. I don't. I don't think it is a problem. Okay. Because at, at the yeah. end, it's it's. It's given by that, but by how you are advecting. So if I were to advect okay. it the other way around, you I would have the. Yeah. So in this okay. case, uh, in this case, it's it's it doesn't seem asymmetric, but it's it's also asymmetric in this case. You see that there oh, is more okay. diffusion in this in this direction. Actually, this direction. I, okay. 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 Thank you. Uh, okay. I receive another question. How easy it is to use the your code or, or numerical method for other applications? Uh, uh, in, as long as it's the same, the same PDE, the same partial differential equation, it's it's easy. 
the issue right now is that it was not not written in in a way that that you could usually easily sorry modify the the partial differential equation so if you are doing something with hydrodynamics then yeah it's it's generic so you can tackle whatever in principle okay yeah. I, if i may uh, follow up questions but then the, the combination of these two methods in some sense like the scheme even like your um, your code might not be used like that directly maybe the scheme or the idea can be extrapolated to other application right yep okay okay do we have any more questions let me check again there. yes roberto yeah. Um, hi, uh, David. Uh, very nice the talk. I I, wa I wonder because when when you were, you were presenting the how these uh, instabilities were uh, appearing, uh, my question was related with the type of the cell. In the sense, since you are using like a rectangular uh, grid, <laughs> is any effect if you modify the the shape of the cell? Let's say. I, or, or, the, or, the, or a question just to complement this doubt that I'm, I'm saying, the, if there are some direction in which you the, the code manifests larger uh, uh, noise in the in the solution. I mean, I think that if it is a movement directly in the X or Y direction, it's kind of a smooth, the movement. But if it is in the diagonal or in, a, in an angle, uh, they would present more instabilities, is it? Correct what I'm saying, or is uh, I mean, if your fluid is moving in in a way that is not horizontal or, or vertical, actually, it's harder to tackle these instabilities than the one that are just moving according to the to the grid. No, actually, actually, it's the opposite. When when there are where are where are things aligned with the with the mesh, that can create artifacts. Like there is a. For instance, the like carbuncle instability. So okay. For instance, if... Maybe it was the opposite. <laughs> and the other, the, the, the question, the, the other, the first question was if it is any any improvement or gain if you change the shape of the the grid instead of I don't know rectangular or square cells, you have hexagonal cells in order to map also the uh, a plane or something like that. Uh, more commonly. The the people use uh, triangles. That's that's another way to to do it. But I actually I I have I have no idea of the benefits of actually doing something with with those kind of measures. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I was wondering just the, if the if the mesh has an impact in the. I mean, not no, the it, number it, of cells, but the the, 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 the the morphology. No, for sure. It it has an impact. Yeah, but maybe yeah. it's harder to, to cope. <laughs> the, the, to include something that is irregular or something like that. Because uh, I remember that for some application related to uh, structure formation for dark matter and stuff like this, there were some code that they tried to use like adaptive grids, but they said that there was a nightmare because yeah that there are yeah there are different different approaches to these kind of things there are in in these kind of methods like like mesh uniform meshes the common thing to to do to increase just locally the the resolution so that you don't have the cost of doing the same cell size and just where whenever you in the locations that you know that there's going to need, be need for more resolution, you increase the resolution. There is adaptive mesh refinement, and yeah, it's it can be quite convoluted to do that. There are other things like uh, voronoi tessellation, where at each time step you form these like these cells of weird uh, morphologies. And all of these things actually have a have the same issue as I mentioned before here that whenever you don't have a uniform a uniform mesh, you imprint the geometry of the mesh on the solution. Mm. Okay, I understand. 
So for instance, if the, if the sound wave, sound waves are propagating in the in the fluid after passing several times in this kind of like non-uniform mesh, you are gonna modify the sound wave, the front of the wave. Yeah, because it kind of you are projecting the solution on the on the mesh. So it's yeah. time projection of projection. Exactly. Of projection. Yeah. Okay. I understand. Okay. Thanks. Okay, I think we have time for another question. Uh, I guess I'll have to summarize this one. So for the small perturbation, how do you know that a small perturbation should not be washed out? And, or, and if it's what's happening is not an artifact of the higher order. How do I know that it's not? I, I guess I guess the question is if you have a small perturbation in for the uh this this was what you talked at the end of your talk. Yeah. How small yeah, like, yeah, I guess uh, like how small is too small such that for example, if you add the perturbation, nothing should happen. And if something happened, is due to your numerical method. I guess that's what the question. Okay. Is. In this case, for instance, we know that this is a solution. Okay. We know that, that that's uh, a solution. That's an ethical solution. We know that this is this is supposed to happen. So if it's if it's doing this thing, like it's actually clipping the solution, it's not allowing, it's totally smearing the what was happening there. We know that it's not it's not part of the so this is an artifact of the of the method. This is like the, the method not being able to capture what is supposed to happen. And here it's capturing what is supposed to happen. Okay, I if if there is a follow up, uh, okay. we will now. Thank you. Uh, okay, okay. Do we have any other question? Um, I have a question, David. David, which is yep. like you show all these classical tests. Is there a test that your method doesn't pass, <laughs> uh, or that you know, or that you you expect it to have a, a lot of issues? Right now, with 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 MHT. At high order, there is this uh, test called the orsat tan vortex, where I see that going to high order, uh, it can it can actually the, the simulation can can crash. So there are and, and more or less what, what's happening there, if you can comment a little bit. I'm 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 still trying to understand what's happening there. Okay. So I I guess it's at high order. You have it's you have more or better defined instabi instability. So these discontinuities are more discontinuous, let's say. So I think that's that's the issue. Whereas with, with low order, these kind of things are kind of smooth and well are diffused by the by the method, and you don't see these like sharp discontinuous uh, things happening. If I go to high order. I don't know. I think it's something like that. Okay. Thank you. And thank you very much for this nice webinar. I guess uh, a lot of people are very interested in this method so they can, might be able to apply in their own research. We'd we'll be happy to see your, your talk. Um, I don't see any more questions. Uh, we, have, we hope to see you in the next uh, webinar to everyone. Thanks for participating, David. And see you soon. Bye-bye, everyone. Okay, okay, ya no estamos live. Okay. Muchas gracias.